for Spiderland in general, is it a five star thing or are you thinking it's not quite a five star record? Objectively, I mean, if I was objective. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. In this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on... David Pajo, the final part of a very, very special five-part Pajo series. Episode five brings yet another moment we've all been waiting for. Most of this episode will be given over to Spiderland. Actually, more accurately, I'd categorize this episode as slint and such, meaning we spend plenty of time on related acts like The Four Carnation, Will Oldham, and King Kong, and Pajo has consented to rating every single release between zero and five stars. Look, if you know, then you know, but if you don't, then you ain't going nowhere, because right this second is your chance to stop embarrassing yourself around friends you give a shit about when the subject of slint comes up. Tonight's guest was one of the founding fathers of emo and math rock, with both slint and tortoise, not to mention his ludicrously prolific, insanely high-quality solo career. But just on their own, his collaborations with Billy Corgan, Bonnie Prince Billy, Gang of Four, The Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Interpol, Stereo Lab, and Royal Trucks would qualify the man as a Hall of Famer. David Pajo is a legend. In this episode of Discography, Pajo reveals the psychological ramifications of producing emotionally vulnerable music from within a hardcore scene that considered that incredibly uncool. Why the Four Carnations fight songs is both the most criminally underrated EP of all time and the spiritual heir to Spiderland, and just how many stars out of five Pajo gives all these classic records. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Although this particular episode is a regular interview, Discography is a music obsessive's dream come true. The guest and I explore their favorite band's entire discography in a futile but valiant attempt to reach a higher truth, which often is cleverly disguised as a nerdy compendium of star ratings and lists. The show is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all. The real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. Be sure to follow along with us chronologically as we go. The link to our legendary playlist is right there in the show notes. Coming up, we've also got Jennifer Harima from Royal Trucks rating the New York fucking dolls, Will Oldham, both Vashti Bunyan and the Association rating the entirety of their own output, and Anthony Fantano, the origin story. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. Do it. And away we go then with David Pajo as he grapples with the towering legend of Spiderland. There's like a mythological vapor that surrounds the completion of the record. You know, there's the vibe that everyone, or not even a vibe, but I remember being told that, you know, everybody had a nervous breakdown and then the recording was finished. And I mean, you know, this is of course back pre-internet. So it's wraps of information. Is some of that stuff played up for a similar reason why Bon Iver would, you know, want to have the cabin story? I mean, I think some rumors developed and some were just not true, but if anything, in the documentary, it was played down a little bit. Oh, really? And there's, yeah, there's still some things that I don't like or just that seems so 
the personal enough that I don't want to, I don't think it's fair to share, but that was a magic time for music where the only information you had was the album cover, you know, so you would stare at it because otherwise there were no other pictures of what this band you like look like, you know, you couldn't find anything and you would have to listen to the lyrics. And so this mystique would be created that's missing nowadays from bands because of the lack of information that was around Slint. It, It definitely served us better in the long run, but I think of all the lessons I've learned in the music business, the one that shaped me, I feel like the most was us breaking up right before Spiderland came out and it didn't hinder people discovering the record somehow, you know, like even though we were this obscure little band that didn't exist anymore and only had six songs on this one album that's pretty short, it still took on a life of its own and reached people without publicity, without tours. And so that's been my MO ever since. All that other stuff, all this stuff that everyone in LA seems to get caught up with, like, uh, oh, I have to do this to get likes and, and I have to play these shows. If I open for this big band, maybe more people will notice me. To me, it makes all that stuff, you know, not that it's not important, but it's not the most important thing and that the most important thing happens in the practice space. Yeah, Um, but the likelihood of anybody in Silver Lake, you know, kicking around the idea of making a great record to stumble upon what you did was you guys were looking to make some music and accidentally stumbled upon the eternal. No one's going to do that. So, you know, best of luck, you know, creating a like a TED talk at NAM or what have you explain how to do that. It's a once in a lifetime thing that happened. It totally is. Yeah. I've had to accept that, that there's magic to that, but I'll just never understand or be able to reproduce. And we all know that. I mean, everybody. No, but that's okay. That's not the end of the line for you. No. It kept happening to you again and again. That exact kind of thing that you guys channeled in there was a once in a lifetime thing. You then went to much different places than just that. But that's a vein of inspiration that is unto itself, you know, without having even gone into any detail on any of the songs the only thing i would point to and say it's like this would be fight songs by four carnation right that's it that's amazing because i i really do love that ep and that was brian's state of mind at that time too which is years after spiderland i just know how it makes me feel and it's a scary place to be yeah a scary place for me to be all right let's drop the needle on this Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener-supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest, or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all. Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discography. I almost don't even really know what to say about the music itself. There's so much to say, but yet I am so familiar with it that it's a tough one. So my notes are all written like, you know, like Kerouac had the roll of manuscript paper. Yeah. So I I just started typing and that's it. So my takeaway for Breadcrumb Trail... I love the uh, unselfconscious way in the documentary where Brit is explaining the usage of harmonics. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> oh Plenty man, that like part somebody, cracks me up. Like somebody who just took his very first day of music class. Yeah. And yet he's creating this genius shit. And that irresolvable dichotomy is to me the heart of what makes Slynn such a genius band. <laughs> I love that moment in the yeah. documentary. I'm trying to explain harmonics and he's like, what does he say? Like, it's something like, it's this cool thing that makes a great noise. Yeah. It was like, it was just, it was just something cool to do. (laughs) Right. Right. And you know, this is where the metal in Maurice and in your past feels harnessed. 
and twist it into a beehive of pure pummeling power. You know, this is another hallmark of your band where it hits you just as hard in the head as it does in the heart. So it's this very cerebral thing where the emotional component is never left behind. And that's where all the math rock practitioners that came in your stead get it all wrong. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's really poetic, the lyrics, much more poetic than, you know, than Tweez. But it also, what sets it apart from pretty much everything else I've ever done is just how naked it gets, how vulnerable Brian makes himself. And I know that he wasn't proud of it at the time. Of the whole record. And I don't think he ever wants to be that vulnerable again, you know, and I don't blame him. You know, he really opened his heart on that album. And maybe that is why the songs are at the end of the record, because he, he was embarrassed. I know when Albini first heard Washer, he just like shook his head and, and total embarrassed. He felt bad for Brian. He was like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> when he first heard it, he was like, oh, shit. Like, what has he done? Like, this is the most, you know, because we're coming out of a world of big black and killdozer and bands like that where people didn't play quieter or sing you know yeah so this sounds like jim croce to the people in your crowd totally yeah it sounds like bad cat stevens to them you know but then he said when he listened to repeated listenings he got it but his first reaction was how most people reacted when they first heard it at least people that knew us at the time he really opens himself up on that record and I, and it never happens really again you guys seem so confident when you're playing it you know in the basement of the walfords there's no one except yourselves who you're auditioning for so are you concerned about how it's going to be accepted oh uh, not at all i mean we were only concerned about what our friends might think you know that was about it like if our closest friends like if david grubbs didn't like it that would mean something to us but right other than that we didn't even imagine other people hearing it you know <laughs> I don't think we put much thought at all into what other people thought. We're totally just trying to make ourselves happy, you know, and by ourselves, I mean everyone in the band. Because if one person didn't like an idea or this riff should go three and a half times instead of three times, if one person didn't like that, you know, it would all be discussed and worked and labored over until we were at a point where everyone was happy, you know, we all had to be happy. And so like making everyone happy, it had to be something pretty cool. <laughs> you know <laughs> what kind of band names are you writing on your trapper keepers at this point you mean band names for Just like a uh, band that you were digging oh that we were into oh by then i think we weren't doing that anymore I think we were really just getting into old music you know and most current music we weren't very excited about to be honest you weren't digging the red hot chili peppers at that point no i remember when their first album came out and it was produced by andy gill and i remember will oldham playing it for me and I was like, I like funk and I like white funk, but yeah, I don't know about this one. <laughs> I, I wasn't totally sold, but I remember Will liked it, at least the first album. I cannot reconcile the image of Will Oldham turning you on. To Red Hot Chili Peppers, yeah. <laughs> That's just, my brain falls apart before I'm able to figure that out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my favorite on the record has always been Dynamon. I love that. The oh, way, nice. Uh, look, I love Nosferatu, man. I get, you can make a case for any of the songs, but there's certain components of Dynamon that, you know, the boxes are ticked off for my favorite kinds of music. The way it kicks in with just the sentence, Don stepped outside, I get shivers down my spine every time I hear it. It's so creepy. And, uh, I believe the gateway drug for the record, even more so than Good Morning Captain, it's always the one I introduce to people first, if there's no prior knowledge of Spiderland. You know, there's a corollary to me. Uh, have you ever seen Francis Ford Coppola's film, The Conversation? Yes. Yeah, that's a great movie. Love that movie. And, you know, there's a largesse to the Godfather films that's absent here, where it's just this simmering of intensity, which I always found to be a hell of a lot more masterful if you could do that without the explosion. And Don Amon has that in spades. And I think about the conversation all the time with this record, just in general, the economy and the grace with which you guys are deploying these things, it makes the small moments so much more impactful. So the simmering, the simmering of intensity, it's across the board, left, right, and center on Don Amon. It's the thing that stays with me 
because when someone can pull that off, you just know innately that you're in the presence of masterful players. But then the song explodes, and right at the perfect moment, the power chord fist thrust thing. Is that you? That's Brit kicks on the distortion there, and I'm playing along with them, but I don't turn on distortion. I'm doubling everything that he plays on guitar. That's funny because that song was the only song that we had never practiced. You know, so we practiced for over a year, these five songs, <laughs> Pam also, so I guess six songs that was taken off. But Donnie, man, we only heard that for the first time when Britt said he wanted to record it. We all thought it was a bad idea because we only had one weekend to record all the basic tracks. This is a total last minute edition. Brian had never heard it. I'd never heard it. Maybe he played a tape and said he wanted to record it, but I don't think we ever thought that we would have time. And Great. then he wanted to take time to record it. And I had to learn it really fast because I was doubling his parts. And I remember people shaking their heads like, man, we already have no time. Why are we wasting? And it's like you said, it's a masterful song. Brit is such a great songwriter. <laughs> like, that was all his concoction. And I wasn't convinced until after he had done the vocals. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is something different. And did you read the Rolling Stone interview with us from maybe a year or two ago? Yeah, at the time, I didn't reread it for this. I learned some things about Slint that I'd never known. <laughs> you know? Like Brit said that Donnie Mann was an anagram for Madonna. Yeah, that I just learned. And that blew my mind. Like, I was like, what is it? Like 33 years later or something, you want to drop that bomb on us? <laughs> right. Yeah. And he's like, I thought it was obvious. <laughs> I have this thing. I've always had this thing, and I'm going to do an episode on it at some point, about guitar solos that happen or great guitar moments that occur after a perfect line. The end is he felt he knew what that was. Yeah. Which is just a great lyric anyway, but I mean, like really, really strong. But for that to come before, you know, the triumph and power chord stuff is just perfection. And that maddeningly satisfying echo of the two chord cycle that goes on and on into infinity. Where the distorted guitar fades in and echoes what it had played before. Even that is such a bizarre compositional move, but it's so perfect that Bridge has got a hell of a mind, man. He's... <laughs> Yeah, a lot going on behind those Yeah, eyes. and so positive for such a dark record. There are moments of hopefulness in it, I feel like, and that's one of the moments, you know? Washer is amazing. This is your favorite song, right, is Washer? I like all the songs for different reasons, but I think the one that influenced me a lot later was For Dinner, actually, the instrumental. Yeah, I love Brit's, the way that he's playing. The It sounds like the toms are padded, but really menacing. I mean, that's one of the reasons why he's one of my favorite drummers is because there's a lot of drummers that claim to play with dynamics, but they don't hold a candle to Brit. Because like even when on the 2005 tour, there'd be times where he'd be tapping so lightly that the mics couldn't even pick it up. Like only I could hear it because I was standing right next to him. You know? Yeah, he's he's a force. Yeah, it's a perfect record. I love, by the way, the structure of this thing. You know, being this sort of creepy whispering into your ear, and then building to a scream is pure genius to the level where it almost doesn't matter what's said or what's yelled the structure itself promises that there will be payoff is this uh good morning captain or yeah exactly it, yeah good morning captain becomes a psychological cum shot no matter what brian is screaming that's true it's the only point of release on the on the album it's so, the whole album is building up to that it feels like because yeah. everything is so repressed and and there's so much tension you know it's pretty much inarguable that his vocal is one of the greatest performances in music history because you can palpably feel how invested he is and brit's kind of lazy rolls under all that hard grind is yeah. just across the board whoa and then what he's singing without really knowing the specifics behind it you know i'm trying to find my way home and i'm sorry and i miss you it's so powerful yeah but like all that lead up to the i miss you part was all improvised you know he was he was trying out different ways to lead up to that and that just was one of different ones that he tried and probably my biggest contribution to the album was telling him to keep it you know not to tape over it because he would try out an idea and then we'd roll back and tape over it and try it again and and that was the time when i was like no no you got to keep that one he wanted he to wanted tape to over it he wanted to get rid of that take yeah that lead up part because he had the verses written and he had the i miss you part 
at the end, but he didn't have anything in between. And so he was improvising that in the studio. And then there's and, all, you know, there's these stories and I, I really don't know if they're stories or if they're real, but that he threw up afterwards or that he was institutionalized after. And I mean, you know, obviously you want to trick out and tease out anything that's going to create a legendary aura around the proceedings. But did it really take that out of him? Yeah, I think because he knew he was, uh, you know, this was not cool or, or like to make yourself that vulnerable. And in our world, you know, of touch and go music, you know, and we knew this record was coming out on Touch and Go, but I, I'm so glad that it was important enough to him that he he had the courage to do it. But it took a lot out of him, for sure. Like, we had to turn off all the lights in the studio. He did it in total darkness. So we couldn't see him. We were in the control room, but we just saw black from the window, and, you know, while he was doing the vocals. And he was definitely, you know, he was telling a story, and he was almost trying to assume different voices for each. Because the story, there's a narrator, and there's different characters in the story, and different characters speak. So he was really making this story for the lyrics for Good Morning, Captain. He was, he was presenting it as almost like a movie. But when yeah. it came to that part... You know, he had to get drunk, he had to take some pills, he had to work himself up to get to that point. And I think he got sick just because it was, he'd mixed booze and pills, which he shouldn't do. <laughs> um, but it was just to give him the courage almost to do that part. There is truth to, to some of that stuff. And not to make him seem like a basket case, because he's not at all. He was really going through some rough times and we knew it. But, you know, he kept it to himself and he did need a break. And like when he, when he checked himself in, like we thought it was just because he needed to, yeah, just take a break from his life and his current situation and, you know, get some space. We didn't think it was like he lost his mind or anything. We thought that was a rational thing to do. Right, right. Like a catharsis and you're just double checking to make sure you didn't leave any pieces of yourself behind, right? Yeah, yeah. To me, he was taking care of himself. Like he knew that he needed some help and he couldn't do it while he was still entangled in the situation, you know? He had to leave the situation to make some sense out of it. Also, that three-year period that you were talking about, like I, yeah. I forgot to mention this. We also all went off to different colleges. That's why there was such a long gap. Todd was in Bloomington, Indiana. I was in Evansville, Indiana. And Britt and Brian were at Northwestern and Evanston, Illinois. So we could only work together when we had breaks. What did you think about Indiana? It's so close to Kentucky that we always joke about Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have anything against it. I liked Evansville for the most part. And once again, I'm used to really small, boring towns and you have to make your own fun. So it, it was fun. <laughs> you have to make jack shit if you're in driving distance of Steak and Shake. <laughs> <laughs> I love a Steak and Shake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all I remember from Indiana. That's all you need to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this record is, you know, if I got to throw some rubrics around it's like a prog folk metal hybrid stew that somehow also none of those things. Uh, <laughs> it, it feels like what the world looks like to four young boys who exactly at the same time were experiencing that bridge into adulthood. It's got all the earmarks of an all-inclusive, impermeable, enclosed sound world in which one can actually exist, which is also an earmark of all the greatest albums of all time which this easily is not a controversial opinion, but a strongly held one nonetheless from way back the first time I ever heard it. This is a very hard five stars. That's a very articulate way of putting it. Well, listen, I get one crack at this thing. It's super important that it be reflective in some way, shape or form of the depths of emotion I feel toward this record. It's a really special one and very unique. And man, am I curious if you feel like it's less than a five-star record? Um, gosh, I think that's another good question. I <laughs> I mean, again, like I I love all the slint output, but you know, at the time that it came out and we were already broken up, I didn't even listen to the test pressing when we got home. I was so bummed that I didn't realize I was bummed at the time, but I, I was so bummed that we didn't exist anymore. And I remember hearing it and all I could hear were the mistakes. And I was like, oh man, this isn't the best example of who we are or who we were. And then things that Brit usually did at practice on the drums that I didn't hear. There was stuff that Brian usually did I didn't hear. And the, 
There's stuff that I did that I thought was really sloppy, but we only had a weekend to record all the basic tracks. So I thought it was okay. And then when it started to take off, I really didn't want to have anything to do with it, which is weird. What do you you mean exactly? I loved Slint. I was proud of it, but I didn't want to, you know, exist in its shadow. You know, I didn't want to, I would deny that I was even in the band sometimes when people would ask me. Was there any kind of intensity on anybody's part in the band? to frantically keep it together because holy shit there's stuff happening who was waving that flag more than anyone else to keep it together yeah i think maybe brit wanted yeah i know he wanted to keep it together but i told him like it's not slint without brian if he doesn't want to be in the band we can continue to make music but let's not call it slint you know and we did continue to make music because we played on the movie star single we played with palace brothers but his first it, single that kind of thing like i picture somebody opening a door in a plane and the wind is blowing so hard so you're just trying to shut the door and you just you just can't and then finally you get the door shut which is like having some control over you know the intensity of the emotions that you guys are feeling during this time and so why would you fuck around with the intensity of that kind of situation never open that door again that's what it yeah. feels like it would be but maybe i'm just reading into it i have no idea we all stayed friends and we actually did continue to write songs after brian quit a couple years later we got together to work on some other songs and we wrote some and there's just some tapes of that that yeah. brit has but it wasn't it never really it was really interesting the direction we were going in and you know we've talked about recording again and writing new songs together and even on some of the reunion tours we talked about reworking some songs so drastically that they're almost <laughs> different new songs you know a couple of outtakes you had pam and glenn pam is much more in a metal only lane without the subtle nuance of the rest of the record and then glenn glenn i love sort of a slowed down creepier version of the track from the 94 ep yeah Um, but glenn i could have heard on the record yeah brian wanted that one off too and i which i didn't understand but to his credit he was right (laughs) like i mean it probably wouldn't have hurt the record but maybe it wouldn't have been such a perfect world i feel like because i feel like you're right you put on breadcrumb trail like you know that you're entering this world now you're entering spiderland and It doesn't let up until the last note ends, you know? Yeah. I think any other sequence, I don't know if it would still have the same feeling. It would not, because that is just absolutely perfect. So there's no need to pack it to the rafters with material. But for Spiderland in general, is it a five-star thing? Or are you thinking it's not quite a five-star record? Oh, I would would say it is objectively. I would have to give it five stars because I think it changed my life for the better. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, if I was objective... No, I, I have to accept that it's perfect the way it is. You know, it works and all. And I, I guess I still don't accept it. Like, I, I'm still just, God, you know, we could have done better. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I wouldn't say that about a Miles Davis record, you know? Like, I'm sure they had other versions of songs that maybe were better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would... I would I would say it's a five. And then how about Pam and Glenn? Now, for those, I'll give them, I know they're outtakes, but I'll give it uh, three and a half stars. I think they're solid, but you guys were right to leave it off. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would say the same for sure. You're giving it three and a half right on the dot? For those two songs? Yeah. Yeah, to me, they are different from the rest of the songs. And by that time, Glenn was an older song, and Pam was kind of like an offshoot of when we were still doing tweez type stuff. Right. Yeah. I like this stuff. Definitely not the same vibe. Definitely right to leave it off. And then what you were talking about before in 92 and 94, you guys reformed in in secret on purpose, right? Yeah. And hold up in a cabin years before Justin Vernon did it for Bon Iver. He just (laughs) stole your thunder. Then the 1992 discarded post Spiderland demos, Todd's song and Brian's song. Really cool stuff. When you revisited this, had you heard it before? Was it sort of buried away this whole time? Do you have any recollection of having done it? Yeah, I remember hearing all that stuff back then. But yeah, I didn't know where the tapes were or who had them. But yeah, they played all their ideas to us. There's like two songs I I think only Brit has recordings of that we recorded in 94, maybe, that are really cool. They use a different kind of tuning, and it really is like an extension of what kind of album we would have made after Spiderland, because it was was starting to move into another direction, for sure. What kind of vibe did you feel? It feels like it had more of a plaintive drift to it, less of a focused intensity and more of an ambient feel to it. I mean, that's just the nature of the demos. I mean, they were just meant to be like a 
single idea, then it would go through all the, you know, we'd all hold up our microscopes to it, you know, once it was in practice and it would become a different thing. But as far as like initial song ideas, that was a pretty normal way. You know, I think Breadcrumb Trail started off like that, you know, just like a singular idea that we all just kind of continue to take apart and reassemble and stuff. There's integrity and then there's a slit level of integrity, you know, and I don't know if you guys used the word at the time or if it was ever a discussion about integrity, but, you know, in my, in my mind's eye, I'm picturing, you know, you guys trying to figure out how to move forward and solve an unsolvable riddle about how to keep this music pure as the driven snow in a world where just its existence, just the fact that it would exist would be some kind of compromise. Yeah. I mean, integrity was always a trait that we strive for, even before Slant, when we were just hanging out as friends. And I think that was part of the hard coursing that we were part of, being true to your values and morals and, and not like other kids your age or whatever. I'm picturing yeah. a lot of conversations about it. Way too many. Yeah, I don't, but it was never, we never used the word integrity, but, you know, we would definitely step up, you know, we definitely had morals, you know, we would say something wasn't cool or something was cool or, you know, and we didn't think it was cool to cheat on our girlfriends, like that kind of thing. Whereas yeah. every other guy our age was bragging about how many girls they'd slept with, you know, we were like, yeah, I've slept with the one girl for the past year and it's awesome. You know? <laughs> but like, yeah, I think mostly it wasn't really because the four of us in a room together, there's something, you know, that's what's special about certain bands. And that's the magic of certain bands is that it's not so much who we are as individuals, but once we're all together in a room, we all reflect different parts of ourselves to each other. And that's what becomes slant. And we kind of are so self-critical that we're really on our toes around each other like to make sure you know like this idea i'm presenting it really is i think it's a great idea and we know that we'll have honest opinions from everybody and we're going to be really detail oriented i don't think of myself as ocd but when i'm with Britt and brian and todd <laughs> together my ocd is all on fire <laughs> yeah yeah the group mind must have so much focus to it it must be borderline maddening but it's fun for us like that's absolutely that's, we actually enjoy yeah. it yeah <laughs> yeah. I get it with 100% empathy there. And this material is interesting to me because it sounds for the very first time, not in, an, in a crippling way, but it sounds like there's a self-consciousness in these two outtakes, the Todd song and Brian song. It sounds like you guys are musically trying to solve the riddle about integrity and so are focused maybe a little too hard. That was my takeaway just this time out in hearing. Yeah, I actually like sense. it yeah. very much, but it feels like a part of that process about how to move forward, keep this element, you know, it's like an exercise in a sense. I mean, Slim was always in a state of transition. You know, we were never like all those recordings were just, you know, photographs of where we were at that moment in time. And and then by the time the photograph was developed, we were already somewhere else. So it, we were just picking up where we left off in a lot of ways. But I think there was a little bit of self-consciousness where the record is actually starting to sell. And we were starting to hear that people liked it. And then by 94, I think not everyone was convinced that Slint was getting popular or getting known outside Louisville and Chicago. I knew it because I'd been traveling a bunch. And so maybe it was more self-conscious, that stuff. More than just us and our friends are going to be hearing this. Um, right, right. Yeah, before this, maybe there was none of that potential. Yeah, there was none of that for sure. I still like this. I give it three and a half stars. We're just talking about Todd's song and Brian's song here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to rate it. They're just ideas. You know, they're not meant to be yeah. finished pieces or anything. This I'm is just, an idea I'm I had. I'm rating yeah. on it only because I'm a douche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what I'd rate it. You can slap an N slash A on this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one can never really move on from Spiderland, but just in in the sense of at some point we got to talk about another record in 93 you guys were pretty much the backing band i believe on will oldham's first lp there's no one what will take care of you the title of which used to drive me nuts yeah <laughs> repeating it over and over and trying to think is this correct um yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> 
Now, I'm not going to spend too much time here because it's everyone from Slint backing up Will except for you, right? Yeah. I played on his early singles before that, I think, like the Drinking Woman single, or is that the Ohio Riverboat song? Yeah, that's the um, very first thing he did. And that was everybody in Slint, but all playing different instruments again. Like Brian McMahon plays drums on Ohio sure. Riverboat song, I think. And I think Britt's playing guitar. Were you just busy when he was doing this one? For the album, I had gone to art school in England for a year. So I was just gone the whole time. And when I came back, I started playing with Will and like touring with him as soon as I got back. But uh, yeah, I missed the recording of the album. It's a weird one. I almost feel like this is a dry run for his career, but I feel like at least the way I was experiencing it live at that time, the true beginning feels like Trudy dies to me. Yeah. That's where the emotional component really ratchets up for me. Anyway, you're not on it, so it's dead to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 95, the Four Carnations Fight Songs EP. This is John Herndon on drums, Doug McCombs on bass, and then you and Brian. This is, in my estimation, an absolutely perfect release, which is, you know, why I'm so excited actually to end on this, because this is the last one. You got Grace Beneath the Pines, How I Beat the Devil, and Get and Stay Get March. I love the song titles. I love the fact that there's two long songs with How I Beat the Devil almost feels like a turnstile in that you got this really quick track that almost feels like just a through way to get to the third track. Lyrically, it's amazing. The intensity that is streaming out of Brian, it's quite clear he's operating at a really high level where it feels like he's still in the booth just having recorded Good Morning Captain. Oh man, I love that EP. That's one I can never get sick of. I'm glad you love it too. But that's a great way of putting it. I never thought of that as how I beat the devil is like hurling you into the third song. It really is. The riff. And then there's a yeah. time signature element involved in it that is really wild. It almost has a weirdness to it in that it's kind of straight up. There's less of a like an art damage thing to mm -hmm. it. So that when you get to get and stay get March, the heaviosity is ratcheted up even further. Get and yeah. stay get March has a defeatedness to it that it feels like the end result of when you have really intense creative experience like Spiderland, the exhaustion, uh, there can be a postpartum that's involved with something like that, which I'm sure you know all too well. And the feeling of that come down to me is all over get and stay get March. Man, I, I totally agree with you. And I don't, I don't know. I wish the four carnation had continued with that trajectory after that i mean i yeah i really like all the stuff afterwards too but even I live too, i think but this yeah. is something different yeah man i mean i i can't give him enough props the fight songs is so good and i always feel like he's ahead of the curve creatively all the time what has even he been the, up to since i mean the last four carnation release was 2000 so that's 23 years is he still writing stuff you know what has he been doing after all that gosh i don't Outside of the Slint reunions, I don't know of anything he's done musically, which is a real shame. Do you think he's scared of the power of what he finds when he goes there? Because he's not a walking on sunshine kind of guy. This is not a guy who writes songs as a craft. Yeah, not you're, you're right. You're absolutely so right. This isn't an exercise for him. It's not. No. So is it the toll that it takes on him creatively? Do you feel like there's a toll that is exacted upon him when he goes to write a song? Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to figure out how Brian or Britt's minds works a lot of the time. But I, I would say that that's probably a fair assessment. And I think that he also might struggle with, and I don't want to like armchair like you know no, sure. put psychology on them but like i think the duality of having to be a creative and an artistic person versus someone who pays rent and works for a living i think that those two elements are always in conflict you know and i think his desire just to i wish we lived in a socialist country or something but like his desire just to get work and get by and not in an abject poverty or something is pretty strong and and i don't know where creativity and art and poetry fit in there you know I, you should talk to Brian. Like having an interview with him would be all interviews with him and Britt and Todd are always really great to me. Yeah. I want to know, you know, why the fuck he's been depriving us. 
<laughs> I'll ask him <laughs> next time yeah, I talk I mean, to him. What he does and what he provides is very important. I've listened to this so many times, and um, I don't know why the thread was left here. You know, even the two other four carnation releases, they're good, but I feel like he backed off on this particular exploration. And for me, this specific EP has always been the true spiritual heir to Spider-Land, where Spider-Land evokes an awe-inspired terror in me. This feels like that feeling, but with the shit kicked out of it. Slump-shouldered, dejected, and utterly, utterly crucial. And so it's absolutely beyond me why this is rarely mentioned in the same breath as the other great works of Slint. But life is a mystery. And this is one of my favorite records of all time, without a doubt, in my top five EPs ever. Plus, that really coherent structure that's intrinsic to this is very unique. This is a hard five, in case you hadn't guessed. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Just to bring it up to date with regard to Slint, in February and March 2005, there was an 18-date Slint reunion tour. And in April of that year, you released your first solo album, Not Bearing a Pseudonym. So you had said you didn't want it to be a reunion band that keeps reuniting. I know that this is going to be it. So, you know, how do you see the reuniting of Slint without new material, just as a sort of ongoing concern in that way? Well, the, yeah, the, the 2005 one, I never imagined it would happen. Anytime people talked about Slint after 19... 19- 94, I guess. I was just like, it's never going to happen. <laughs> you know, like you can beg all you want, but we're just not going to play again. And then 2005 happened and I had to eat my hat. And that was basically because we were offered enough money to be able to do it because we were essentially starting from scratch and living in different cities. Yeah. There was no way that we could get it done and do it the right way that made us all happy unless it was funded, you know? And for me to play music with those guys again, I would do it for free, you know? I would pay money to do it and I have. But so it wasn't like I didn't have a problem with doing it. I didn't imagine it would happen. We were all sure that it would never happen again, that it, that was it. It was just that one run. And hopefully that would close the book on Slint. And it didn't because we sold our equipment after that tour. We put everything on eBay and <laughs> that we were so sure that that was it. And then we ended up doing it again in 2007 but when we did it again i think we started taking away the tweet songs and by the time we did did it in 2014 we were primarily playing spiderland with a few tweet songs and you know one of the songs we worked on in 94 after 2014 i think we were all just kind of fried on playing those same songs and we didn't we didn't make a vow we didn't discuss it even really but i think the idea was like i don't want to play these songs again unless we have new songs that we're presenting and we just have never written anything so was there ever anything more than like a half-hearted notion that's a big you know the kevin shields loveless thing of how the fuck are we going to climb that mountain yeah got to be tough. And plus, regardless of whether or not you do or don't attempt to create new material, really for you guys, it does feel like just you guys playing is incredible enough. You know, because with some bands, it's not a fit. It feels weird. It's a cash in. It doesn't feel that way with you guys at all. It's a blessing. It really is. And so if you can humor me just for a moment, you know, having the great good fortune of being able to have a bird's eye view on the overview and shape of you guys' arc is a band here's my flight of fancy so the wild totally unrepeatable tension of a bunch of sophomoric boys who got off on bathroom jokes and clowning around and then stumbled into the hypnotically unimaginable realms of darkness and the infinite that you guys did ensures that this will serve as a potential port of entry for most any boys who are making that transition you guys accidentally wound up experiencing the ultimate arc during your time with the band in one concurrent whoosh. Started off fucking around as boys and came out of the experience looking to me like you were staggering around in a daze, wondering what the fuck happened as men. Look at Astral Week's Smile, Blonde on Blonde, a lot of the greatest albums of all time, the greatest works of art ever created even were assembled or channeled by children, really. That's what you were, but through the course of laying down these six perennial mood setters, you became men. So Spiderland then, much more than just a record, it's a rite of passage. There are many paths to become a man, but this is a really valid option. It certainly was the one I picked. 
top three records. Number three, Tweez. Number two, The Four Carnations Fight Songs. And number one, Spiderland. Worst album, none, because you guys just don't make bad music. Oh, man. <laughs> that's that's incredible. It certainly yeah. is. It's all you're doing, not mine. But it's hard to put into words, you know, and I know that you have a lot of history with this music and personal, you know, you've had a lot of personal experience for decades with this music. So I know that you don't say any of that lightly, like all of it's, there's a whole story behind every word. So that's awesome. There really is. This album is a friend of mine, like a lot of the friends that you have that we talked about right out of the gate. Blood on the tracks, Dyke Reutz and yeah. your friends. The good ones grow with you, you know, as you exactly. get older. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for all of it. You're a talented son of a bitch, man. You really are. Oh, thanks, gosh. Yeah, yeah. I, I try. I don't know. I, I never really know what I'm doing ever, but uh, I kind of trust I'm going the right way, I hope. <laughs> thank you for being both prolific and really good. Some people have one or the other, and very rarely both. So let's get to the point where you plug away the plethora of incredible things that you're involved in right now. What's happening in your world? The most exciting stuff I can't talk about, unfortunately. There's a couple of things I really wish I could tell you about, but I'd be blowing my wad too soon. <laughs> so yeah, there's some cool stuff happening this year for sure. You're basically going to be taking over the show for a whole bunch of weeks. So if we get to that point when it airs and you're able to flip that card, I'll plug in some stuff in the intro or outro. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Cool, man. I got to say, I'm sad that this is over. I really am. It's been a lot of fun talking with you, man. Oh, man. Same. Absolutely. This is, I mean, the most well-researched interview I've ever done. Absolutely. Without a doubt. It's been pretty incredible for me, too. I know you're an open guy. You go to those places. But ultimately, you know, I'm trying to get a more well-rounded impression of what the fuck life is through these talks. They're not just music talks. Yeah. I'm sure you get the vibe there. Absolutely. Well, you're a great motherfucker, man. Keep up the great work thank you david yeah thanks for inviting me and uh this is intense does your butt hurt too from sitting <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes it does. i put in so much work doing this but then during the interviews themselves i find them very relaxing i tend to not notice how long these things are but we've been talking now for five hours yeah i think it's been five hours now yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's incredible and um yeah we'll stay in touch for sure yeah without a doubt if you ever need anything man if there's anything i could do to help out in any way shape or form please let me know thank you i appreciate that i will all right, that about does it. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, David Pajo, the man for putting up with nine hours of questioning, Drag City, Jeff Kamara for hooking this epic thing up, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography D Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography D Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, hey, no sweat. Just email me at info at discograffiti.com and I'll keep you regular as it were. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper is to go straight to the beginning and listen to all five essential episodes of the David Pajo series, which begins at number 94, not to mention the Pavement series, in which Bob Nastanovich rates the entire Pavement catalog from episodes 49 through 58, and the Lou Barlow series, in which he spends two episodes rating the Zombie Zombies, and then we go full on with an unbelievably bare Lou interview, even for him. That's episodes 59 through 62. Also, episode 12 is PJ Harvey. Episode 18 is Pixies. And of course, episode 30 is Nirvana. But wait just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. 
Join us as we descend down, down, down on Discograffiti's week-long Spiderland and the Spider-Verse deep dive. Of course, if you're a Patreon subscriber, then you already know to keep your ears peeled throughout the week, because this Monday brings the Patreon-only wildcard episode, my personal copy of The Beach Boy's Smile, which I can tell you I've been honing and honing for nigh on 35 years by this point. This is objectively going to be the best thing I ever post on Patreon. Not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discograffiti's The Private Press, yet another final chapter of an epic interview that we're seeing to a close this week. Our four-part series with Texan psych legend Bill Miller about his insanely great band Cold Sun and his involvement with Rocky Erickson and the Aliens in the resuscitation in part two of that Texan psych legend's career. And if you don't know Billy Miller and you feel like maybe you could just skip it, I want you to picture the un underground bunker that literally was built to house this record down in Corpus Christi, Texas by legendary man of pretty darn good music taste, Ashley Johnson, seeing as you don't want to fuck around down in hurricane country when you possess the only copy ever made of one of the greatest records of all time. Uh Uh-huh, you heard me right. Make sure you visit patreon.com slash discograffiti and check out the deep dive as a music obsessive's way of life. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, Friday, June 30th, we're coming at you with Alan Arkish, the music-obsessed director of the Ramones Rock and Roll High School, Get Crazy, Elvis Meets Nixon, and The Temptations, as he gushes effusively about his top 10 favorite albums of all time. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies, it's Discograffiti! Discograffiti!